Good afternoon. I'm Mandy Cohen. I'm the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, and I'm joined this afternoon by the Director of Emergency Management, Mike Sprayberry, and special guest Georgina Dukes from Unite Us and the NC Care 360 platform, which we're going to talk about today. Brian Tipton and Monica McGee are our American Sign Language interpreters, and working behind the scenes are our Spanish translators, Jackie and Jasmine Metevier. So first, as always, I'll start with a rundown of the numbers. As of this morning, there are 53,605 laboratory-confirmed cases, 870 people currently hospitalized, and sadly, now we have had 1,223 deaths. We're seeing significant spread of COVID-19 across our state. Our key metrics that we look at and are on our dashboard are moving in the wrong direction. The percent of emergency room visits for COVID-like illness is trending upward for the second week. Our cases continue to climb and the percent of tests that are positive continues to be high at around 10%. Our hospitalizations are at some of their highest levels since the start of this pandemic in the mid 800s. And the largest increases in cases that we're seeing have really been in, in younger folks, those under the age of 49. We're also seeing that our Hispanic and Latinx communities are per being particularly hard hit by COVID-19. Many work in essential services and industries that our state relies upon, like construction, childcare, and food processing. These are industries where social distancing can be challenging, health insurance is often not provided, and staying home when sick may mean not only not paying the rent, but also challenges putting food on the table for their family. We are doubling down on partnering with our Hispanic and Latinx organizations across the state to support ongoing prevention practices, accessible testing, trusted contact tracing, and supports and resources so people can stay home when they need to. North Carolina also has a new tool to make it easier to connect with people who need the support and resources to help them address the devastating impact of COVID-19 that's having on many of our residents in our state. As of this month, we now have an infrastructure in all 100 counties connecting healthcare and human services. It's called NC Care 360. NC Care 360 is the nation's first statewide technology platform that unites traditional healthcare settings like a doctor's office or a hospital with organizations that address non-medical drivers of health, such as food or housing, transportation, employment, and interpersonal safety. NC Care 360 enables health and community organizations to make electronic referrals, communicate in real time, securely share client information and track outcomes together. It's a groundbreaking achievement that was completed six months ahead of schedule as the team fast-tracked this statewide expansion in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Having this critical infrastructure in place puts our state in a way stronger position to address the devastating impact of COVID-19 that's having on so many of our residents, and it's going to help us recover. NC Care 360 breaks down silos that have created barriers to needed care and services, particularly in our rural communities. Those silos also exacerbate the health disparities that we see across our state. NC Care 360 puts people at the center of service delivery. Since the network launched in 2019, more than 1,000 organizations in the state have joined the network, and there are more than 10,000 organizations in the referral debt database. The work to build and deploy NC Care 360 is a result of a private-public partnership between the Department of Health and Human Services, the Foundation for Health Leadership and Innovation, and many partners. Our implementation team has included the United Way of North Carolina, NC211, Expound Decision System, and Unite Us. With me today is Georgina Dukes, the Unite Us Network Director, to share more about this important milestone, and I'll turn it over to her now. Thanks, Georgina. NC Care 360 succeeds because we empathize with our communities. We realize that we, as North Carolinians, are done putting our community members through traumatic cycles of seeking help. 
In fact, right around the corner in Johnston County, we had our very first referral in the Triangle area, a referral for a woman, a mother of three, who went to a local church for prayer because she wanted to get back on her feet. Because that church had onboarded to NC Care 360, they not only prayed for her on that Wednesday evening, but one of the staff created a profile and sent an electronic referral for that mother at the Bible study around 9 p.m. for employment. The referral was accepted by the local NC Works Career Center by 8.30 a.m. the next morning, where the mother was able to get assistance with employment. These two agencies that would not traditionally refer to each other were able to successfully help a mother get employed by not giving her a sheet of resources and hoping it works out. The mother was able to seek help from a door she trusted because we meet people where they are, not where we want them to be. And now these two agencies were able to connect via the network within 12 hours, which is unheard of. As of 1.30 p.m. this afternoon, over 2,400 North Carolina lives have been positively impacted by the NC Care 360 network. When we say lives, we are referring to our friends, our family members, our neighbors, and colleagues who are seeking help to address a social need within the past 12 months. There are community-based organizations, government agencies, healthcare entities, faith-based organizations, and so much more across North Carolina that work day in and day out to provide direct care to fulfill these needs. But as many of us know, it can be very challenging for anyone to navigate in crisis as access to health and social care is not always equitable. The NC Care 360 team has sought to enhance the great work that our community has already been doing providing a single shared tool that will increase awareness of available resources, create a direct channel of communication between service providers of all types, and improve the experience of getting connected to help for a person or family in need. We have been driven by this really ambitious vision of offering NC Care 360 statewide in all 100 counties by December 2020. Many question whether or not this could be accomplished. Many wondered how could we scale across an entire state in two years. As skepticism rose, we began to work. NC Care 360 launched in our first three counties, the mighty Guilford, Alamance, and Rockingham on March 4th of 2019. And today I stand before you proud to say that we did it. We now have coverage for NC Care 360 in all 100 counties and we achieved this goal six months ahead of schedule. The North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and the Foundation for Health Leadership and Innovation had an understanding of what the community desired to make a positive impact for all lives. Their leadership in this public-private partnership brought together United Way of North Carolina NC211, Expound, and Unite Us, my direct employer. Each one of these agencies has had a monumental impact on the progress that you see in the NC Care 360 network so far. What's next for us, you may be asking, now that we are live in all 100 counties, what's next is that we go deeper. We are thankful to the early adopters across the state who saw the need for change and took the chance to lead this innovation in their communities. We have only scratched the surface of what can be done in North Carolina. We are now ready for more. Every day the team is monitoring the NC Care 360 network, pulling out insights and analyzing gaps in services and disparities that exist in each county. We are constantly bringing on new community-based organizations and healthcare partners into the network. Our goal is to grow this number, especially in our rural communities. We are asking for your leadership, your support, and your voices to help us go deeper in growing this network. Help us understand where the resources are needed. Help us understand the key populations that need to be supported, whether it's our elderly community, our children, or our historically marginalized and oppressed black, indigenous, and people of color. We need your help to grow this impact. We are ready to take this to the next level after we've done what was considered impossible. I promise you, we will not be done until inequities no longer exist for every North Carolinian and every North Carolinian has the equal opportunity to not only survive, but thrive. Thank you.
Georgina, well, thank you so much for your remarks. And I just want to say how incredibly proud I am of you, your leadership, and the entire team that's been working so hard on this. This has taken an effort of so many partners across the state, and it's just the beginning. I see this as a critical tool to help us recover from COVID-19. When I think about the kinds of supports our communities are going to need, whether they're actively sick with COVID-19 and need to stay home and we need to support them at home, or we're re- reigniting the economy and we need to help folks get back on their feet. So this is a really proud moment for North Carolina. And I think for us as a state, this tool will make us better able to respond and will make us a standout uh, amongst states, uh, particularly here in the Northeast as we work on this together. So Georgina, thank you for that. And thank you to the the very large team of folks. We couldn't have everyone here because of social distancing, but want to make sure that we are thanking everyone who has worked on this healthcare system, community organization, private, public. Um, It's been a huge team effort. So thank you for that. Now, before I turn it back over to Director Sprayberry, I also want to announce some new updates to the COVID-19 dashboard. We love data. Tonight, we will launch two new features. One is county demographic data, including race, ethnicity, gender, and age, and a reporting of clusters in child care programs and schools. Like long-term care facilities, child care programs and schools are required to report outbreaks to their local health departments. And because of this, this feature will be online today at covid19.ncdhhs.gov. So check out some new data down to the county level. I think that will be helpful for everyone. Finally, I ask each North Carolinian to take the simple actions of wearing a face covering that covers your nose and your mouth. We will keep doing our part at the state level to promote prevention, increase testing, expand contact tracing, but that won't get us there alone. This is a moment where our individual actions will determine how we fare as a state. And that is what keeps me hopeful. I know North Carolinians are strong, they're resilient, and care fiercely about their communities. Let's show our pride by practicing the three W's, wearing that face covering, waiting six feet apart and washing hands often so we can get back to the people and places we love. With that, I'll turn it over to Director Mike Sprayberry. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and thank you, Georgina. I'm fired up now after listening to you. What a great program, North Carolina Care 360. It's gonna take us to some really great places and help out a lot of great people. All right, today is 105 of the State Emergency Operations Center's COVID-19 response. As we continue to purchase and provide personal protective equipment, supply lines have improved in the past few weeks. While we were very short on N95 masks and isolation gowns about a month ago, we now have more than 2.5 million N95s and 1.4 million isolation gowns in stock. That's a great improvement. In addition to filling regular resource requests, we are pushing PPE supplies to the nine counties that are seeing the largest increases in new COVID-19 cases. We are also sending supplies to state agencies and finalizing plans to start PPE shipments to school nurses. We're also transitioning some shipments from our warehouses to use contract shipping companies such as FedEx and UPS as the National Guard right-sizes its force on the COVID-19 response. Tomorrow is an election day for many counties in Western North Carolina where there is a second primary for the 11th Congressional District, as well as a local primary in one of our Eastern counties. The State Emergency Operations Center will be activated to support the State Board of Elections, as we are for every election day, to help ensure safe and secure elections. Thunderstorms over the weekend have extended the flooding conditions along the Tar River Basin. Today, the Tar River is cresting at Tarboro and Princeville at moderate flood stage, but the river's peak remains several feet below the top of the Princeville levee. We're still closely monitoring. The river will crest tomorrow at Greenville at moderate flood stage, and impacts to homes and buildings are forecast to be minimal there. We're watching river levels closely as afternoon thunderstorms can bring flash flooding in areas that are already saturated. Sampson County is also recovering after nearly a foot of rain fell in parts of the county over the weekend. DOT crews are making repairs to US 701 between Newton Grove and Clinton, 
or part of the road washed out. For the latest on river levels and flood conditions, remember that FIMAN.NC.GOV is the website to use. That's FIMAN.NC.GOV. Please remember, do not drive through standing water. Find another safe route. Turn around, don't drown. Lastly, remember to observe the three W's. You heard Secretary Cohen. Wear a cloth face covering. Wait at least six feet apart and wash your hands often. That's wear, wait, and wash. This is how we will slowly, we will slow the spread of the virus working collectively together. As always, don't forget to look out for your family, friends, and neighbors and to call your loved ones daily. Guaranteed they'll appreciate it. With kindness and cooperation, we will all get through this together as one team, one mission, and one family. And again, thank you, Georgina, for all of your hard work on NC Care 360. Great, thank you so much, Director Sprayberry. And with that, we will turn over for your questions. I'll remind our reporters on the line to please press one if you have a question and then press five if you have a follow-up. We'll take our first question from Brandon Goldner at WCNC TV. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Cohen. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, if you can give a preview of what your thoughts are on seeing the child care facility numbers and especially as we're talking about possibly phase three, what your thoughts are on uh, that possibility going into that? Sure. Thanks, Brandon. What you'll see tonight uh, when we post our clusters uh, related to child care, there are three. Um, so we know we have lots of child care centers across the state, so having three is not, not a, a huge number. But it reminds us again about the importance of uh, the transmission of this virus. It's in our communities, and we are starting to see more uh, spread in, in settings that involve, involve our kids. I'll remind folks for our children, um, what we see is that for the vast majority of kids, that um, kids are less impacted by COVID-19. I think the data is still evolving to understand, do kids actually transmit? the virus in the same way adults do. It looks like kids transmit the virus less uh, less well than adults do. Um, but we still know there is a rare inflammatory condition in children that we continue to monitor as well. Um, again, very rare. Most kids are, are generally see very minor or even no signs of uh, COVID symptoms if they are carriers of of, of COVID-19. And to your second question about where we are with our trends, obviously they're, they're not going in the direction that we want. Um, we are trying to find the right balance here between reigniting the, the economy and protecting the public health. We don't want to get to a place where we overwhelm our healthcare system. We do see our hospitalizations and our ICUs, uh, the, the use of that by COVID patients going up but we still do have capacity uh, in our systems and we monitor that very, very closely. Um, so that, those are the things that we'll be watching uh, this week as we work towards a, a decision about how do we move forward here in terms of finding that right balance of uh, making sure that we are protecting uh, public health, not overwhelming our healthcare system and working to make sure that our economy is reignited. Thank you. Our next question is from Garrett Bergquist with Spectrum News. Good afternoon, Dr. Cohen. Uh, Garrett Bergquist with Spectrum News. A uh, couple of questions regarding the increase in uh, cases. Uh, number one, are we seeing any uh, increases that can be traced to any specific event, such as either the events at a Speedway or any of the uh, recent protests? Are we still too soon to know? And then second, uh, and mainly just to recap, what is the latest guidance on who should get tested and when and what sorts of resources available for that? Thanks, Garrett. So first, in terms of what we're seeing related to cases, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, we're seeing our new cases really being driven largely by folks who are younger. 
um, those who are under the age of 49, and we are seeing disproportionate impacts, particularly in our Latinx and Hispanic communities. Um, that is certainly an area of focus, but I think all of our historically marginalized communities are being disproportionately impacted. Um, and so we are, are seeing outbreaks and, and transmission of virus, um, as you can imagine, in uh, industries that are um, th where social distancing is, is challenging, uh, where folks are essential workers, where they have more exposure to, uh, to the general public. Um, but we also know, obviously, the meatpacking uh, uh, plants at the place where we are, we're seeing viral spread. And again, where we know um, we have a lot of folks who are in Latino communities work. Um, we're seeing that in some of our agriculture space and on some of our farms where they, they live in congregate settings and work on farms. Um, we're seeing in our construction, manufacturing. Um, and so those are the kinds of places where we want to make sure that everyone is doing a couple of really important things, right? It starts with wearing a face covering. What I think we're learning more and more every single day, more and more evidence mounting that face coverings work at preventing viral spread. But everyone has to do it every day, every time when you're around other people. Um, so face coverings, waiting six feet apart, and washing your hands. We know that many workers work in essential industries that get, keep our economy going, that they can't social distance. Some of them have been labeled critical infrastructure by the federal government. They have to go to work. So we we need to make sure we're doing everything we can to protect uh, those workers and then protect the, the homes that they then go back to. Um, so it starts with making sure that we have the right protective equipment. Um, and so we're going to continue to, to uh, share that message and, and work with our, the employers on that. Um, as far as the latest guidance on testing, thanks for bringing that up. Testing continues to be a really important component, particularly for, for folks who may not have symptoms. What's, what we're seeing more and more with the virus is that people are, are, are spreading their germs of COVID-19 when they feel completely fine. They don't know they have it and they're spreading it. So our testing guidance is really this. One, if you have a symptom, cough, fever, absolutely test uh, right away. Um, the others are for folks who are in more high-risk jobs that I was just just talking about. Are you do you work in industries that are more public facing, where you have more risk of potentially being exposed? Um, so we want symptom exposure, um, either by your job or maybe you've had close contact with someone who has had COVID-19. Those are all things we want to, folks to get tested for right away. And we have been saying, if you attended a protest or other mass gathering, you should get tested as well. Um, so that's where we are with our testing guidance. We have heard that there are, ver you know, there are various sites doing testing. A lot of these are private businesses. They may have their own sets of, of ways of screening people in or out for testing. We continue to share our guidance from the state level about what we think is appropriate for the state of North Carolina in terms of testing. And so when we hear about individual businesses saying, oh, well, protest doesn't, doesn't count or something like that. We try to work with them, help them understand the risks, understand why we put our guidance together. Most have then uh, uh, rethought their own guidance and made adjustments to uh, make sure that they're conforming to the state guidance. But they still are a lot of these private businesses, so we'll continue to work with them um, as we go through here. But we want, if, if you are, are turned away for whatever reason by one testing site, we have more than 500 testing sites with more companies every single day. So again, a huge effort to ramp up testing uh, activities. So we really want folks to uh, think about their own personal exposure and risks and to go get a test. Thanks. We have a follow-up from Garrett Bergquist at Spectrum. Thanks, Dr. Cohen. One other question, uh, clarifying about the cluster data you're going to be publishing. Uh, right now, are you only limiting that to child care facilities and uh, congregate living? Are you also looking at anything else that might be seeing a particularly serious outbreak, such as some of the meatpacking plants you alluded to earlier? Sure. Well, we already put data up on our website on all of those that you just mentioned, meatpacking, um, uh, long-term care. What we are adding is uh, data related to child care and school. 
as you know, that there are certain industries that are required to report to us. Um, those industries, we will not only report the aggregate data to say, hey, in a county, this county, you may have had a, a child care outbreak, but we will also refer specifically to that business when they are required to report to us. Um, in other places where we haven't been required, um, that is where we'll, we'll share the aggregate data um, with folks um, so that folks understand maybe in their community where are some of the exposure uh, points that, that they want to be um, understanding um, and making sure that they're protecting themselves and their family. Um, so what you'll see tonight is cluster data related to, to child care and schools, which is required by law to report to us. So you'll see not only a child care in a particular county, we will also share the the names of those specific uh, uh, schools or child care locations. Our next question is from Rebecca Martinez, North Carolina Public Radio. Hi, Dr. Cohen. Thank you so much for taking my question. This is Rebecca Martinez from WUNC. Um, I, I heard you just say, you know, among the people who should be seeking out testing was if you've been to a mass gathering, get tested. I want to ask you to, to go a little deeper on that for me. It's been almost a month since Memorial Day, since folks have been going to Ace Speedway, since the reopen protests, and then the other protests that are happening around the state uh, related to police brutality. Are people getting cases from these mass gatherings? Are these people getting COVID? Does contact tracing bear that out? Rebecca, thanks for that question. And so I think we are still just about a, at a two-week window from understanding that. So it's the kind of data that takes a, a bit of investigation and a detective to know what were was the protest and was there a particular location of a protest where there is spread. So, so far, we haven't seen anything pop to the surface where we felt like we needed to report to a broader uh, group to say, hey, if you were at this particular protest, really want you to pay attention. So nothing like that has yet popped. It doesn't mean that it's not there. It takes a bit of time, like I said, to do this detective work um, that our tracers do um, and as they're, as they're trying to compile this information. So nothing to share yet, but we continue to look um, at our data. I think we are seeing that as we move around more um, and that we have more virus in the community, we are seeing our cases go up. Um, and, and again, we, we've been saying that it, it's not, not uh, hair on fire, but we are needing to take this moment, like this is the time to say, what can we do differently to change the trajectory of these cases, right? If we're going in the wrong direction, we just go up and up and up. At some point, we reach a point where we only have a limited amount of resources. And we, there are only so many beds that we could even surge to. And if you're only going up and up and up, at some point, you got to do something to change that trajectory, which is why we're really emphasizing the things that each individual that every business can do. It doesn't take away from the economy at all, and that's face coverings, waiting six feet apart, and washing your hands, right? Those are the keys to that allow us to keep moving forward with the economy uh, and, and keeping things open, but it's got to change the trajectory of our trends because our trajectory, and uh, the, the way things are going is, is not the, the right direction, and we all need to work together to keep things um, and keep that viral level low. I think you'll, you'll know, and for, those of parents of school-aged children certainly know that we have to get our kids back to school. Um, that is a huge reopening, if you will, that we really want to focus on. And that's why it takes all of our effort to keep that virus level low so we can make sure that it's safe for our kids and our teachers to go back to school. Thanks. Our next question is from Julie Havlock with the Carolina Journal. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. I wanted to ask if you are planning to reopen bars and gyms next week. Julie, thanks for the question. I think we are still obviously looking at our trends. I've been sharing that they're obviously not going in the right direction. We're trying to make sure that we are always looking at that data, but trying to weigh that against, uh, understandably, we, we want to reignite the economy. We want folks to be back with our, their, their loved ones um, and being back at work. Um, so we're trying to find that right balance between uh, that reopening and protecting public health. Some of the things that continue to remain closed are some of the higher risk activities, right? It's, it's large venues where a lot of folks would come together. It's activities where we know social distancing is, is hard. Um, it's, it's activities like a, a gym where we know um, that, you know, heavy breathing and you're not wearing a mask and a lot of surfaces in a gym, more risk. 
It doesn't mean that those are things we can never get back to. It just means we have to work really hard at keeping that virus level low across the state because the more viral spread we have, it makes each one of these activities that more risky, right? So what we're trying to do is slowly uh, uh, look at our trends as we reopen things. And what we're seeing is that as we've reopened, we've seen our trends go in the wrong direction. Um, and we can do something about that. And so that's the work that we're trying to do is say, really, we all need to come together. We need to be using face coverings, waiting six feet apart, washing our hands. That's the thing that's going to help us stabilize those trends, right? We, we want to stop going up and we want to at least get to stability so that we can keep making progress. And so uh, stay tuned as we still continue to look at our numbers um, and deliberate over how to best uh, move forward here. Thanks. We'll take our final question from Rose Hoban at North Carolina Health News. Hi, Secretary Cohen. Um, you know, so you've talked a lot today about uh, the three W's, uh, including, you know, masks. And to be honest with you, I think a lot of us were thinking that we might see a mask mandate. Um, you know, is that in the cards? Rose, thanks for the question. I think the governor shared the end of last week. That is something that we are definitely considering. Um, I think we've seen a number of local municipalities move forward um, with, with uh, those actions. We've already heard from the business community that a patchwork of different actions is really challenging for folks. Um, and I, so, so thinking about something statewide is, is a thing that's under consideration. And again, we're looking for tools that can allow us to keep that viral le level low but don't hurt the economy. There's, our tools here are so unfortunately blunt, right? Go to stay at home was an incredibly blunt tool. Important, we used it to, to have that time to build our capability to respond. And we needed that time because we are definitely drawing on those capabilities right now as we are seeing more viral spread. So one of the things that we can do together is to think about those face coverings, but to do it all the time, every day. But there are a lot of nuances in how would we think about that if we were going to go forward with the mandate? How would we do that in, in a way that is equitable, that folks have access to face coverings? Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were thinking through all of this, working with the business community on, the, on this and understanding their, uh, their concerns as we go forward. So those are the things that we're working on now. But we don't, you don't have to wait for, for, for word from us that it's a mandate. What I'm, I'm sharing is we can do this right now. Uh, right now, you can be getting your mask out, making sure you keep it in your car, throw it in your, your, your purse when you're, you're heading out. When you grab your keys, you should be grabbing a face covering, putting it in your pocket. Never know when you might be around folks that you need to, to make sure that you're wearing this face covering. We're seeing more and more people that have COVID-19 and don't know it and are spreading, unfortunately, their germs to other people. You could be that person. You don't want to be giving COVID-19 to your friends and your family. Um, so wear a face covering um, and we'll continue to look at our trends. I hope if we all do our part here, that our trends will, will stabilize and we can move forward with continuing other easing of restrictions and most importantly, getting our kids back to school. All right, that was our last question. I really appreciate everyone joining. I want to give one more shout out to the NC Care 360 team. Um, please look for more on that. As Georgina said, we're just beginning. It is the start of having that infrastructure. And now it's a matter of like, how do we use that to help our state truly be one of the best at both responding to and recovering from this, uh, this crisis in front of us. All right, thank you so much. We'll be back soon. Bye.